Kia ora Gateway, welcome to Church Online. We're so glad that you could join us this morning wherever you are. We hope you're all well and keeping safe. Believe it or not, it's already that time of year for our Gateway Christmas Appeal. This is a great opportunity for us to be a generous community as we head towards the Christmas season. This year we're taking part in Operation Christmas Shoeboxes, Bible Society Bibles and the Salvation Army Food Bank Bags. Each initiative will have its own start date over the next few months, so we'll announce these with more details in the coming weeks. But to start off, we're going to be kicking off with Operation Shoeboxes. Boxes are available for you to pick up from the Gateway office, which is open Tuesdays to Thursdays, 10am to 2pm. Boxes will be due back mid-October, but we'll let you know the exact date soon. Tonight we have part two of Ask Us Anything with Don and Chris. We had a great time a couple of weeks ago when we did part one, but there were a lot of questions we didn't get to, so we thought it was worthwhile to try and answer the rest of them. And we're going to be live on YouTube at 6.30 tonight, so see you there. Finally, next Sunday night, 26th, there will be no online church. Instead, we encourage you to gather together as friends or family and connect groups or as a team and uh, enjoy some time together as a community. That's next Sunday night, 26th of September. We hope you really enjoy that time together with friends and family. That's it from me. As we head into a time of worship, no matter where we are, whether together or apart, God is with us and he hears every prayer of our hearts. So let's take a moment as we still our hearts before him as we enter into worship. Kia hari te hamama, e te whenua katsua, ki a ihoa. Hamama, ki a hari, aira, hi mene atu. Hi mene ki a ihoa, i runga i te hapa, i runga i te hapa, me te hi mene anō te reo. Let the ocean's waves join in the chorus with their roaring praise until everyone everywhere shouts out in unison, glory to the Lord. Let the rivers and streams clap with applause as the mountains rise in a standing ovation to join the mighty choir of exaltation. Look, here he comes, the Lord and judge of all the earth. He's coming to make things right and to do it fair and square. And everyone will see that he does all things well. At your name the mountains shake and crumble At your name The oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord at your name the morning breeze Shout. 
shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise.
Good morning, Gateway family. Welcome again to Church Online. As you can see, we're in a, in a different spot this morning to record. Uh, welcome up into my office. Um, as you'll probably detect through the message, there are some sound noises going on outside as the street is rather busy with people getting back to somewhat n n near normality. But um, we're glad that you've joined us. Uh, in this series, I'm trying to respond to some of the deconversion stories that I've heard over the years where people have claimed to have lost faith in the Bible's reliability and trustworthiness and as a result have decided to reject their Christian faith altogether. And what I'm doing in this series that I've called Can the Scripture Be Trusted is suggesting that such a loss of faith is not necessary because the Bible is in fact what it claims itself to be, the divinely inspired God-breathed Word of God. In the first message of the series, I talked about the fact that the Bible is a unique book. It's unique in its formation, its circulation, its translation, its survival, and as um, a core part of Western civilization. Now, I admitted that that uniqueness doesn't necessarily make it God-breathed. But in the second message, we look briefly at the idea of the fact that skeptics say the Bible has been hopelessly corrupted over times and that as a result the manuscripts that we do have access to shouldn't be trust shouldn't be trusted. So it's a bit like the game that we used to call Chinese whispers. I guess it's not so politically correct to call it that now. Some people call it the telephone game, where a message is whispered from person to person to person, and ultimately we all know the funny distortions that you can get in such a game. So the idea, the skeptics say, is that that's exactly what's transpired with the scriptures, so that what we presently have is unrecognisable in terms of its original. Bart Ehrman, the New Testament scholar and textual critic who would count himself among the deconverted, says we don't even have copies of the copies of the copies of the copies of the original. Now, Ehrman's claim, and other skeptics who say this, that claim is based on the presumption that the original documents being written on parchment really only had a lifespan of a dec decade or so at the most. And in actual fact, that has shown to be false. In an interesting title called Papyrological Evidence for Book Collections and Libraries in the Roman Empire, researcher George Houston has shown that manuscripts were actually used for anything from 150 to 600 years before being discarded. And the longevity of manuscripts like the Dead Sea Scrolls has proven that to be a correct assumption. So what happens then, in actual fact, is the original is copied and then the next copy is also taken from the original and so on and so on. So it's not copies of copies of copies, it is simply a copy of the original in each case. That being true, the second and third century manuscripts, of which there are over a hundred uh, of the New Testament, may well have been in fact copies of the original. So, staying with the telephone game analogy, we don't have a long line of people. We simply have the original and then the next person in the line. And that person goes and then another person comes to hear the original. I tried to show last week that the critics' claims about corrupted text are totally overblown. And at the end of the day, it's the critics of the New Testament and not the New Testament itself that shouldn't be trusted. The scriptures stand alone among classic literature in terms of the accurate transmission through the years. Now, my skeptic friend acknowledged that, okay, so the variance issue might be a mountain out of a molehill, but that doesn't explain the contradictions that you find in the scriptures. And so in this message, I'd like to address myself a little to, to the idea of the fact that the New Testament particularly is filled with uh, contradictions. Now, my first response to you as I talk about the contradictions in the Bible might sound like a, something of a cop-out. Um, I don't think it is, and I'll explain it as we go. Um, I want to say front, front and centre that I can't explain all the, mystery, the mysteries of the Scripture. Um, but however, because I can't answer all the questions, it doesn't mean that there aren't answers. And people far more skilled and studied than I have actually looked at some of these mysteries and provided sensible, coherent uh, um, arguments regarding them. 
I'm, I'm not going to go through all the contradictions of the Bible. A, we don't have the time. B, I don't have the knowledge. And C, I suspect you don't have the stomach for it. So I'll give you my approach to the Old Testament and then very quickly come to the New Testament, which is the basis for how I actually look at the Old Testament. My approach to the Old Testament is what we might call Christological. And my argument can be stated in a series of premises that go like this. Number one, Jesus taught that he was God incarnate. Number two, God authenticated Jesus' person and teaching by raising him from the dead. Number three, Jesus, God incarnate, raised from the dead, taught that the Old Testament was divinely inspired and promised the inspiration of the New Testament through his apostles. Number four, therefore the Bible, Old and New Testament, are divinely inspired. Now when you look at those four premises, you can see that the argument three and four rest entirely on premises one and two, that Jesus taught he was God incarnate and that God authenticated that by raising him from the dead. If those two premises aren't true, then the others collapse like a house of cards. However, I would want to say that if the first two are true, then I think premises three and four follow automatically. So let's work through that a bit. I think the first premise, Jesus taught that he was God incarnate, can be relatively easily confirmed. Again, I'm not going to take time to validate this. If you aren't sure, then read the Gospels. Anyone will do, but John's Gospel in particular shows that Jesus taught that he was God incarnate. The first 18 verses of John's Gospel are called the prologue, and if you take three key verses, or the, the first couple of verses, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, without him was nothing made that was made, that is incredibly confronting and, and comprehensive. Then if you go to verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory full of grace and truth, and then verse 18, um, no man has seen God at any time but the only begotten Son, and some ancient manuscripts actually have the only begotten God, he hath declared him. Now those three verses put Jesus' divinity front and centre, and the rest of John's Gospel actually goes on to prove that those three verses and the prologue. C.S. Lewis famously presented what has came, come to be called the trilemma. Uh, Lord, liar or lunatic and he, and he said this I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people say about him I'm ready to accept him as a great moral teacher but I don't accept his claim to be God that is one thing Lewis says that we must not say any man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be a, either a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was the son of God or else a madman or something worse. So briefly, I would say the first premise is established. Jesus claimed that he was God incarnate. That premise being established beyond reasonable doubt, then everything hinges on the second premise, that God authenticated Jesus' person and teaching by raising him from the dead. We, we need to know that Christianity is not a code of ethics or a metaphysical system as many other religions are. The validity of those other religions is not actually affected by the truth or falsehood of the narrative framework in which they are set. The stories could in actual fact be false, and yet the ethical system that they have spawned can remain intact. For example, it might be held that the ethics of Confucianism have an independent value quite apart from the story of Confucius's life. Christianity, by contrast, is based on history, on historical events, which if falsified, completely undermine and destroy it. The Christian narrative is bound up with historical order, for it tells us how, for the world's redemption, God entered history. The Eternal came into time, and the Kingdom of Heaven invaded the realm of earth in the great events of the Incarnation, Death, and Resurrection of Jesus Christ. That Christianity has its roots in history is emphasized in the earliest of the church's creeds, which fix the supreme revelation of God at a particular point in time. As our creed says, Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate. 
inner point in history, this historical once for allness of Christianity distinguishes it from many other religious and philosophical systems that aren't, as I say, related to any particular time. And so it makes the reliability of the writings which purport to record this revelation a question of absolute first rate importance. Paul completely understood the claims of Christianity to be based on actual events that took place in history. So in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 13, the message translation reads, If there's no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. And everything you've staked your life on is smoke and mirrors. Not only that, but we would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. God. All these affidavits we passed on to you verifying that God raised up Christ, sheer fabrications if there's no resurrection. Now, knowing that the resurrection, uh, if the resurrection can be proved to be false, Christianity absolutely collapses, then critics and skeptics have hammered away at the truthfulness of the resurrection for centuries, and yet it remains. Gary Habermas, who's one of the foremost scholars on the subject of the resurrection, comments on a massive shift that has taken place in the academy over the last five decades or so regarding Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Habermas says that in the 1970s, if you said you believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus, you would have had a howl of derision from the secular critics. Today, he says, not so much. Habermas states that even secular unbelieving critics now acknowledge three things. Firstly, Jesus was crucified. Secondly, that on the third day the tomb was empty, as the Gospels had claimed. And finally, and perhaps most surprisingly, even hardened skeptics concede that the disciples had encounters with what they believed was the risen Christ. Even Bart Ehrman acknowledges this. Now, obviously, they aren't all willing to go the whole nine yards and say it really was the risen Jesus. But they do concede that the disciples believed it was and then lived their lives, the rest of their lives, in the light of that belief. Uh, actually, Bart Ehrman, in a recent work, has taken um, some skeptics to task for their faulty and sloppy scholarship in denying those three clear facts. And he suggests that some of these men should stick to their own disciplines and not make a fool of themselves by straying into areas which are not their realm of expertise, which is a not-so-subtle dig at some of the new atheists. However, Ehrman is far from being a believer, and what he has done is tried to throw doubt on the resurrection story as presented in the Gospels by highlighting what he calls contradictions in their testimony. Critics like Ehrman claim that the Christian faith can only actually be believed if people are willing to embrace historical dishonesty. Not the dishonesty of those three facts that I mentioned. They are established. But, but the contradictory evidence that the disciples present concerning the, the risen Jesus that they encountered. So some of the contradictory points that Ehrman raises are the Gospels are in conflict, for example, about when the curtain was torn. Matthew says it was after Jesus died. Luke records that it was before he died. Ehrman says the gospel writers don't agree on how many women went to the tomb. Luke mentions five women, Mark three, Matthew two, John only one. John says the woman went to the tomb in the dark. Mark has it in the light of day. Mark and Luke say that the woman saw messengers who were men. Matthew and John says they saw angels. Mark, Luke and John say the personal angels were inside the tomb. Matthew says they were outside the tomb. They can't agree on how many persons or angels there were. Luke and John have two. Matthew and Mark have one. The wording that the, announce, the, wording that the angels make in terms of the announcements is given as different in each of the Gospels. Matthew records an appearance of Jesus to a number of women who hold on to his feet unrebuked. John tells of an appearance of Mary Magdalene who reaches out to touch Jesus and is forbidden to do so. Matthew and Luke record that the woman went and told the disciples what they'd seen. John adds specifically that Mary told Peter. Mark says that the woman went and never said anything to anyone because they were afraid. Even Paul, who later uh, says Jesus appeared to the twelve, and Ehrman says he couldn't possibly have appeared to the twelve. Judas was dead and Thomas apparently wasn't there. Well, Ehrman uh, 
claims that such irreconcilable differences in testimonies throws significant doubt on the trustworthiness of the stories that they tell. However, in answer to Ehrman and critics like him, I would want to note that historians do not conclude that an event has not taken place because the accounts regarding it have some discrepancies. If, if witnesses to a car accident differ as to which car entered the intersection first or the number of people that were in the various vehicles or the exact colours of the vehicles involved, is it reasonable to assume that no accident actually occurred? I mean, insurance companies might try that one on, but I don't think anybody else would. Even if you concluded there were discrepancies in the accounts of the, uh, uh, of the accident and that they are unsolvable, it would not be reasonable to assume then that the accident, in fact, didn't take place. Let me briefly try and speak to some of the so-called contradictions that Ehrman highlights, and I'll go through them in the order that I mentioned them a moment ago. Firstly, the temple torn. Was it before or after Jesus' death? Now, you, you have to understand, ancient writers of history did their history in ways that are quite different from the way we moderns and postmoderns do, and we do sometimes find it puzzling. They didn't always strictly follow chronological sequences. They often dealt with common themes without any chronological sequence intended. They jumped sometimes backwards and forwards between two or more parallel events without attention to exact sequences. In addition, while they tried to be accurate, they weren't always precise in the way that we would want them to be. Seeking precision, as far as historical reporting goes in the ancient world, wasn't something that they necessarily valued in the way that, that we do. Precision is a relatively modern idea in terms of recording history. The ancients sought accuracy, but not always precision. For example, I could say accurately, it rained last week. If I wanted to be precise, I might say it rained on Wednesday between 2.30pm and 5pm, which is both accurate and precise. Ancient historians aimed for accuracy, but not necessarily precision. The principle of accuracy without precision actually deals with all sorts of so-called contradictions in the scriptures. For example, some of the gospel writers recorded that the transfiguration occurred six days after a particular event, while another gospel says it was eight days after the event. Now, we immediately say, ah, a contradiction. Ancient historians wouldn't quibble over a discrepancy of two days in the way that we postmoderns do. The event happened that week. <laughs> Excuse me. It could have been a Tuesday. It might have been a Thursday. It doesn't really matter to them in the same way that it does to our precise way of thinking. Now, all three synoptic gospels record that the events of Jesus' death and the torn curtain in the temple happened about the ninth hour, about 3 p.m. our time. The exact precise sequence wouldn't be something that they thought necessary to detail. It was accurate. These two things happened close together simultaneously, one slightly before the other. Um, it, it really didn't matter to them. And I honestly think the detail of which happened first and which happened secondarily is really only a problem for people who are looking for a problem. Did they happen simultaneously? Was one slightly before the other? Does it matter to the story? And I'd want to say, no, it doesn't. Well, what about the woman at the tomb? They differ in terms of how many there were. Was there five, three, two, or one? Here what we have is a classic case of what's called selection is not denial. Now, all authors, all historians select material. You simply cannot record every detail, every thought, every action. So material is selected. What an, what an author selects is always related to the purpose or theme of their writing. Now, John's Gospel states very clearly that although Jesus had done enough miracles to fill all the libraries of the world if they were written down in books, he said, I'm only actually selecting a few and for a very specific purpose. One of the things that John's Gospel actually focuses on throughout Jesus' uh, ministry is his interaction with individuals, from Nathaniel to um, Nicodemus to the woman at the well to Peter in the last chapter. And in keeping with that theme, John focuses on Mary Magdalene's interaction with Jesus at the tomb. John's selective silence about the other woman isn't the same thing as denying that they were present. 
He's selecting. He's not denying. John actually hints at the presence of other women when in John chapter 20, verse 2, Mary says, we don't know where they have put his body. Instead of rather the singular, I don't know where they've put him. So there's a hint there that there were other people involved, but John's focusing on Mary. None of the gospel narratives insist that all of the women arrived at the empty tomb at the same time or that they all stayed together for the whole time. Mary could have and perhaps did linger after the others had left. The truthfulness of an author's report cannot be charged with inaccuracy or lack of truthfulness simply because it doesn't satisfy a particular reader's curiosity for details that are unrelated to the author's purpose. Now John states that they went to the tomb in the dark, while Mary states that they, uh, sorry Mark states that they went in daylight. I'd want to say that's trivial. It was early morning at dawn as darkness is giving away to light. They started walking to the tomb in the dark. They arrived when the sun had risen. Read the accounts. I think if I were a judge and that was brought to my court, I would dismiss the case for wasting the court's time. Well, what about the angels? Were they young men or were they were they angelic? And the answer is yes. Angelic figures often appeared as men, in this case as young men. They were clearly angelic because of the brilliance that surrounded them, but they also appeared to be human. That's not a contradiction, it's just an observation of how they looked to different writers. They were angels in human form, as, the, uh, as other passages in the scripture indicate. Well, was there one of them or two of them? The gospel writers seem confused and give contradictory evidence. Neither Matthew or Mark, who both only record one angel, say one and only one. In a scene where one person is the chief speaker or actor, it would be perfectly natural to admit the fact that he had a companion. It means a simpler and less cluttered message. Their focus on the angel that does the speaking and their silence about his companion cannot be construed to be a contradiction. It's simply selection is not denial again. Well, were they located inside the tomb or outside the tomb? I want to ask, does it really matter? Here we have accuracy, but not precision. Could the angel have been outside and then gone inside? A slight difference in the way people describe a crime scene is entirely normal. Witnesses see and recollect things slightly different, and that never bothers the investigating detectives. In fact, when witnesses are in complete word-for-word -word harmony, detectives often suspect collusion. Does the slight difference indicate that a crime hasn't taken place at all? And the answer is, of course not. And again, I'd want to suggest to you that people who disbelieve over a detail like that are possibly already disposed to disbelieve. Well, Don, what about the fact that writers give um, the angels saying slightly different messages? Again, I'd want to say, while accuracy and precision are not the same thing, paraphrase and quotation are not the same thing. The whole idea of quotations with quotation marks is, again, very relatively new in recording history. This is not, and I quote, it is simply a recollection of what I remember the angels saying. And there's nothing contradictory in the different accounts. There's slightly different recollections, but this is classic eyewitness testimony. The same essential message is given in different words. Well, what about the woman who grabbed Jesus' feet unrebuked, and then Mary, who does the same thing and is told, don't touch? Again, no contradiction here at all. We aren't told the sequence of events, so it's no good assuming they're talking about the same event. He could have appeared to the woman as they went their way and then appeared to Mary who was lingering. We simply don't know. Yes, Mary was told not to touch, but in the Greek, actually, that, meant, that is, don't keep clinging on. It wasn't, don't touch me at all, but Mary, you've got to let me go. Mary, having lost Jesus once, wasn't about to lose him a second time. What we have here is not a contradiction. Well, what about the different accounts, Don, where woman told the disciples and, and Mark says that they, they didn't and they kept silent? Yep, well, Mark 16, 8 says they said nothing to, some, to anyone because they were afraid. But I'd like to suggest to you that Mark is simply noting that this trip back from the tomb is very unlike their conversational trip to the tomb. On the way to the tomb, they spoke to each other about things like, how are we going to move the stone? On the way back, they are stunned and fearful about what they have witnessed, and they say nothing. Now, we also know that Mark's gospel, for whatever reason, ends very abruptly. So it is a huge assumption to say that we have a contradiction here and that the woman never told anybody, like, like never. 
The other gospel writers all agree that the woman talked to the rest of the disciples about what they had what had happened. And to claim that they're contradictory accounts is to claim far too much. And finally, what about Paul? Uh, uh, talking about Jesus appearing to the twelve when clearly there wasn't twelve. There was, Judas wasn't there, Thomas wasn't there. H how do you reconcile that? I mean, obviously Paul's got his facts wrong. Well, by the time Paul had come along, the twelve had simply become a way of referring to the apostolic band collectively, kind of like a nickname. A couple of weeks ago, I reported to my grandchildren that I'd seen the black caps over the road in Cafe 1991. Well, somebody could have come along and said, well, were all the black caps there? Well, no, there was a handful of them, but I didn't feel it necessary to count them and name them. I simply said to my grandchildren, I saw the black caps in Cafe 91 today. There's no contradiction here. I think Ehrman's claim to prove that the gospel writers are hopelessly contradictory regarding the resurrection events falls very flat. And the more you study it, the more it has the feel of genuine eyewitness testimony. John Singleton Copley, better known as Lord Lyndhurst, was recognised as one of the greatest legal minds of British history. He was Solicitor General, the Attorney General, three times the High Chancellor of England and was elected High Steward of the University of Cambridge, thus holding in one lifetime the highest offices that a judge in Great Britain could ever have conferred on him. And he said, and I quote, I know pretty well what evidence is, and I tell you such evidence as that for the resurrection has never been broken down yet. Now, a lot more could be said and has been said by really good scholars, and I recommend Gary Habermas to you, N.T. Wright, The Resurrection of the Son of God. These are resources that are well worth reading um, and, and studying in depth. Now, those things being the case, I'd like to take you in conclusion back to my original premises. If Jesus was God incarnate, and God raised him from the dead to verify both his message and his person, then I'm quite happy to believe what Jesus said about both the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he regarded them as divinely inspired. Mysterious in places, difficult in places, but nevertheless the God-breathed word of God that is both reliable and trustworthy. Now that raises all kinds of other questions, and, and you might say, well, you know, but, but isn't Jesus just a reinvention of the ancient myth of the dying and rising God? Or what about the canon, Don? Didn't the church put that together, throw that together for political reasons in the 4th and 5th century? Or, you know, if Don, if I believe the word of God, does that commit me to believing in a seven days literal creation, a young earth, that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? Do I have to believe those things? What about different translations, Don? Well, you are such inquisitive creatures, aren't you? And uh, I'm glad you're asking the questions. And next week, in the concluding message of this series, we'll come back and look at some of those. God bless you guys. Looking forward to seeing you again soon.
As we close, please raise your hands and allow me the privilege of speaking the blessing of number six over you and your families. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. And may the love of God, our Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you always and until he comes. Amen. Gateway, we're really looking forward to seeing you tonight, 6.30. Ask us anything with Don and Chris. It's going to be a fantastic time. Enjoy your day.